I'm her co-executive director. Um, we lead the Milwaukee Water Commons together, and we often do these presentations um, as a tag team or in a pair, but um, today it's going to be just me. So um, you should be able to see my screen. And there we are. So um, my name is Kirsten. Um, as I said, I'm the co-executive director of Milwaukee Water Commons. Um, and I have been in that role along with Brenda since 2018, um, but I've been involved with Milwaukee Water Commons for um, since near its inception in 2013, um, as we've built this organization uh, from the ground up. And today we're really going to be touching on, um, I'm going to go back to my introductory slide, um, this intersectional approach to environmentalism and how that um, impacts the way that we approach protecting and stewarding and access to our waters and also how that intersects with climate change. So it's a relatively large topic, I'm probably gonna zoom way out, but then I'm gonna try to get down into some details of implementation. Um, I recently served on the governor's task force on climate change here in the state of Wisconsin. So we'll talk a little bit about state action, talk some about local work, um, and especially talk about why intersectional environmentalism we really think is the way to approach um, this topic. So a little bit about Milwaukee Water Commons. Um, we're a cross city network. We foster connection, collaboration, and broad community leadership on behalf of our waters. We formed because Milwaukee was positioning itself as a water-centric city. Um, which had a lot to do with industry, some to do with academia, but not a lot to do with community input. So our vision is really that Milwaukee would be a model water city where we all have a stake and a say in the health of our waters and we all share in their care and their benefits. So to do that, we promote stewardship. We talk a lot about equity and access and we really want to have shared decision-making around our common waters. So rather than kind of do a broad overview of the organization, I'm actually gonna play a little video for you that should be loading here um, that we developed at the end of last year that um, just goes through some of who Milwaukee Water Commons is and you get to hear a number of voices. Earth belong to everyone and to no one. And that with the commons, we have shared responsibility to make sure that our planet, that our earth, and in particular, what we focus on water is healthy and that we steward the water. So we have a responsibility to the water as the water has been a gift and a blessing to us. Hi, my name is Brenda Coley and I'm the co-executive director of Milwaukee Water Commons. The way that we organize, we use three to four frameworks the commons philosophy, environmental justice, collective impact, and community engagement. Frameworks really help guide us. If we are thinking of an activity that we're going to do, we're going to look at these frameworks to tell us if we are within those boundaries. We also look at our work, the issues we take on through an environmental justice lens to be sure that the most vulnerable communities, people of color, indigenous people, are thought of well when we're taking this stand or we're doing this work. At Milwaukee Water Commons, we're really proud of our annual events. We have three events that happen every year, the Confluence, the Cream City Classic, and We Are Water. And there are times that we really bring the community together to celebrate our shared water and to tell stories about our connections to water, to highlight work that's been done, and model what it looks like to be a truly water-centric city. Celebration, bringing the arts, bringing our cultural perspective is critical to the work that we're trying to do at Milwaukee Water Commons. Water City Agenda was really an example of community engagement for Milwaukee Water Commons around this idea of Milwaukee becoming a, a water-centric city. Um, so folks generally speak about Milwaukee as a water-centric city, uh, which makes sense because of its position on Milwaukee's three rivers and on the shore of Lake Michigan. But what we had seen through our organization was that the community was not really engaged in deciding how Milwaukee really was becoming poised as a water-centric city. The conversation was more about technologies and businesses, and, which is an important component, um, but it didn't center community priorities. The water city agenda was an attempt to bring together the community to say, if we're gonna have a water-centric city, 
what does that mean to you? What we did was ask 1,300 Milwaukee residents to put their input into what it meant for them to, for Milwaukee to have a relationship with water. And then through public input process, through engagement, we were able to whittle that down into six core initiatives that would guide some of the work that we would do to really advocate on behalf of Milwaukee's communities. Those initiatives were green infrastructure, water quality, blue-green jobs, arts and culture, education, recreation, and drinking water. Those were some of the core priorities that synthesized all of the input that we got from really just getting out into community events and hearing from folks about how they connected to water. I'm always amazed how often folks will discuss community priorities and things that they see being issues in other systems, as transportation systems, economic systems, public health systems, and think that that's separate from our waterways. But what we really found out with the Water City Agenda was that there are deep connections between the way that we relate to our environment and the way that we think about our relationships to each other. Because baptism is something that we do every Sunday within worship, and when we do our confession and forgiveness, it's around baptism. So we're constantly making the link to water in our sacred lives and it being a sacred thing to how we live and how we show up in the world. We were real excited to learn more about how we could be better stewards of water ecology and then also just learning more about Milwaukee River, the tributaries, and also Lake Michigan. When we prompted the folks in our congregation about who would be interested in that, we actually had to pare them down and say, okay, we can't have a team that large. And so it was really a great response. Our congregation and the people that we were able to talk to really have a better understanding of just the everyday small things that you can do that make major impact let alone then, of course, the advocacy to our legislators about not dumping into our lakes and our rivers. Also just realizing how important it is to just the whole entire ecosystem. So that's a little overview of who we are and how we operate. Um, so I'll just touch on a couple of those items. Here um, we have our four frameworks that Brenda mentioned in the video. Um, and I think really centered here today is we're gonna be talking about environmental justice and, and what that looks like when we really prioritize those most impacted by our environmental decision-making. And when we really look at the intersections of um, social inequities and environmental inequities. Um, we also talk a lot about the commons. That idea is that the water really is not owned by any one of us but it is stewarded and protected by all of us. And so it's this idea of holding something in trust. And I think that, you know, you zoom out and that really is something we need to do collectively as a community and as a, as a global community when we think about climate. Um, we uh, really adhere to the Hamez principles, which were um, created in 1996 by a group of um, uh, environmental leaders of color, really talking about how we organize. And um, there's six of the, I think there's six um, principles in total. Um, this one I'm just highlighting is this commitment to self-transformation. And that is doing the internal work as an individual and as an organization, even as we try to transform the external work. So um, the video we mentioned, um, we have Water School, which is really our leadership development um, programming. And a lot of this programming, as well as our events, um, as you know, in 2020 and into 2021 looks a lot different than normal. Um, we've shifted entirely virtually up to this point. So we did a virtual water school this year, which was really exciting, but um, lots of community engagement around that and leaders taking on issues and learning about watersheds. Um, we are water um, in our other cultural events and arts events are really exciting. We think that this work really requires heart engagement and not just head engagement. And it's also a place where we can really invite cultural um, perspectives, storytelling, um, religious understandings, um, historical understandings of how we connect with water, how it affects people's stories. Um, it's a really fun time. Um, and then Water City 3.0 is our policy work. And um, that's really where we talk about like, how are we gonna make sure that the 30th Street Corridor isn't flooding every year? You know, how can we be part of the solution along with other organizations to make sure people don't have basement backups to make sure that you know our drinking water is safe and lead free. Um, so those six initiatives were mentioned in the video as well. 
Um, and so in this work, we're really transforming ourselves and we're transforming our movement. And so the environmental movement is, is our movement. And we um, really have a couple of things that, a um, couple of concepts that we have been talking about for a couple of years now. And I think have just, the conversation has accelerated as we've seen just the social injustice and the slaying of, of all of the um, black men that have been killed at the hands of police um, and the uh, protests around that and the calls for um, justice. So one thing that we do at Milwaukee Water Commons, we talk a lot about decentering whiteness and that has to do with um, cultural norms and that um, many of our structures are innately white centered um, and that we want to pull whiteness out to the margins along with any other racial and social identity so that we can rebuild a center that is truly multiracial. And it's a much more complex topic than I'm gonna get into today, but um, it's a big part of how we work. Um, and then building an anti-racist multicultural organization. How do we do the work to make sure that we're dismantling those systems and structures in our organizations, in, our, in the city of Milwaukee? We are the most segregated city in the nation. Um, and that is not that was not unintentional in its creation. Um, we have the most incarcerated zip code in the world. We can't not consider that when we talk about environmental justice, when we talk about environmental work. Um, and then our theory of transformation um, is really that there's a whole, there's a number of different roles to be played. So there are resistors in this work. There are reformers that work inside the system and the resistors are out on the protest line. The reformers are working within the existing system. The recreators are thinking of new systems and new ways of doing work, especially around climate adaption and community resilience. Um, and the reimaginers are often tugging at our hearts and our spirits to say like, what could a bigger, better world look like? How could we build community resilience? How could we really um, thrive even through all these challenges? In this picture, I just wanna highlight, um, it's a really uh, touching photo, not just because that mural that's at the corner of Center Street or North Avenue in Holton, um, is really striking that George Floyd Memorial, but because of the three women there that are dancing, um, this was um, a native dance called a jingle dress dance. Um, one of those three women is one of our board members and she in a conversation with Brenda Coley, my co-executive director um, around a lot of the protests and just the pain that was happening in the black community here in Milwaukee around the death of George Floyd. Um, she offered to bring some of her fellow jingle dress dance, dancers and do what is a healing dance in front of that memorial. Um, very, we, it was a very small gathering. We were in the midst of very restrictive um, COVID you know, restrictions. So we didn't even publicize it, but it was just a really powerful picture of what like multiracial um, allyship really looks like in this work. Um, so environmental justice, I think this term is gaining a good amount of traction. People talk about it a lot more, but um, what I wanted to share here is that environmental justice isn't necessarily universally defined. It's not, um, it's, it has different meanings in different communities because it's very, very place-based. Environmental justice is the, dis is the intersection of environmental and social justice. So, for example, an environmental justice issue here in Milwaukee that's raised frequently is flooding. The solutions to that flooding, especially when we're talking about most impacted communities or low-income communities, communities that don't have the means to be able to recover from multiple floods per year, those solutions might look different than another environmental justice issue, say a toxic waste facility in a rural community and what those environmental justice solutions would look like. So building on that is this concept of in intersectional environmentalism. So intersectionality is a term that I think is also becoming more in our vernacular in the environmental movement, um, but it really the history of that term comes out of black feminism. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw uh, coined that term really to talk about the multiple oppressions experienced by black women um, and uh, violence. 
So it's really a way to talk about the intersections of oppressions and how multiple oppressions layer uh, related to race, class, gender, et cetera. So intersectional environmentalism is an inclusive version of environmentalism that advocates for both the protection of people and planet. And we say people and planet a lot around Milwaukee Water Commons. Um, so we are identifying, this identifies ways where the injustices that are happening to marginalized communities and the injustices that are happening to the earth are often interconnected. Um, and we say, you know, if we do good for people, we can also do good for planet, right? We, it's not, these don't have to be at odds with each other. And in fact, we need to look at where they're intersecting. And really this looks and requires us to dismantle systems of oppression um, in the environmental movement. So some of the areas where um, we're doing work around environmental justice, intersectional environmentalism, policy, um, we just broke it out here by Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then more regional work. So um, we facilitate um, an environmental justice roundtable here in Milwaukee um, that's really primarily um, leaders of color and their allies talking about environmental justice concerns and solutions in Milwaukee. It's really exciting. Um, the Water Equity Task Force um, is working on um, jobs and access to jobs in the water sector and looking at that through an environmental justice lens. Um, we worked with um, MMSD and a number of other organizations to um, do a needs assessment and then make recommendations around how we can really overcome the barriers to access because many of these um, good paying family supporting jobs in the water sector and in, in um, green infrastructure, in environmental work um, are often um, underrepresented, I mean, severely underrepresented by um, communities of color and indigenous folks. Um, and then Branch Out Milwaukee is our um, program that is really looking at reforesting the city. Um, we've lost a lot of trees due to natural disease um, as well as to emerald ash borer, which is an invasive bug that is killing our ash trees. Um, and we also know that when those trees die, who can replace them or who can manage them and who can't is an environmental injustice issue. So we are looking at areas of the city that are known as heat islands, where you know, they have higher amounts of heat on those summer days. We don't have the health, public health benefits, the mental health benefits of um, of a healthy thriving tree, as well as the rainwater capture of a tree. So um, that's a project that's really ramping up. We have 30 partners across the city who have come together from government to local nonprofits, to education, to workforce, looking at how we can replant trees in Milwaukee in a way that prioritizes community concerns, includes in, um, education and investment, and um, is sustainable. So as I mentioned in Wisconsin, um, I recently sat on the governor's task force on climate change and a lot of those recommendations have gone into the governor's budget, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. And then on the Wisconsin climate table, which is an or a coalition of groups that have been meeting together for um, probably a decade, looking at how to really um, make sure that Wisconsin is prioritizing climate change and resilience um, in the coming years. And then we also participate in some national networks around this topic. So where I wanted to spend a little bit of time is talking through how do we then center environmental justice in climate work. I feel like we, you know, it's often getting going from value to implementation is challenge. We believe it, right? We believe it's important. This is critical work, but how? How do we do it? And so these six frameworks. Um, were just six questions that um, I posed when we were working with the um, governor's task force around how we could, the, the um, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes really challenged us to center environmental justice in our climate recommendations. The question then is how? So here's a few areas that I think we need to consider when we're thinking about how to center um, environmental justice representation and accountability. Who's represented at the table? 
who's part of the decision-making body, who is um, coming to the meetings, um, and are we accountable to the communities that are most impacted? Um, avoiding unintended impacts. Um, I think that we can put forward a policy. For example, we're going to require solar at this level, or we're going to um, charge more if you don't have you know, the, the proper clients, et cetera. Are there unintended consequences to that? Do we end up punishing those who are also gonna bear the brunt of climate change impacts? How can we avoid those by thinking through what those um, unintended impacts might be at the front end? Um, barriers to implementation and access. Who has access to climate solutions? Who can afford to put solar panels on their roof? Um, and what other barriers besides cost? Are there? Are there assumptions about who drives an electric car and who doesn't? Are there barriers to access to those new green jobs, um, to those educational pathways? Um, another thing to consider is decision making, input, and power. So, who we can have uh, diverse and representative meetings, but ultimately, who makes the final decision? And are we opening up those decision-making bodies to the communities that are impacted? Um, we work with uh, partners across the country that are also, um, you know, especially talking about um, urban poor people of color. We can't just come in with a plan to solve an issue, get a sign off, have the photo op and say that we've done right by a community. How do we make sure that, that the community that we're talking to specifically about an issue that is impacting them, whether that's a neighborhood or a city or an entire um, region, how do they, we make sure that they have decision-making power? How do we, you know, kind of, we say, give them teeth, right? Not just, we don't want you to just sign off on what we've already decided. Um, and then checking our work is just making sure we're always going back throughout the process to make sure that, you know, we're still taking into account what we said we would and then cultural competency. Um, what I mean there, cultural competency can be a little bit of a loaded term, but what I mean is, are we choosing the right messengers? Do we have people talking in the language that the community that we're talking about or talking to can understand um, and having trusted voices doing this work? So there's a quote here from the report that came out of the uh, governor's task force that in practice, achieving environmental justice means guaranteeing that these vulnerable communities receive equal protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process that determines their economic and energy outcomes. So the words I'll highlight there, you know, health, equal access, decision-making, um, and protection. So a um, cu couple of events that we, um, where we try to really uh, engage community and get people involved in this work and celebrate together. Um, I had a little note in here that said uh, TBD for 2021 and I took it out. And I'm like, I don't even know if we're TBD, but um, <laughs> a number of our events, as I mentioned, have shifted um, virtual, but a um, Couple areas in the last number of years where we've centered environmental justice um, is at our confluence. This is our annual um, report back to the community at progress made on our water city agenda. And we um, talked a lot about how do we not just say that we prioritize um, voices that are often left out, but how can we make space for that? And so we centered a panel of women of color and native women talking about their vision and their leadership in the environmental sector. And it was, it was a, an amazing panel. There were six women on it. And um, I think uh, creating spaces like that are part of really building environmentally just climate policy. Um, the Cream City Classic is our crazy idea of a swim in the Milwaukee River. We've done it twice. Um, last year, we weren't able to um, due to COVID. And again, this year, it's, it's going to be postponed. Uh, but 
we had people swimming in the Milwaukee River for the first time in 100 years. Now, don't go do it yourself. It's technically illegal. We had to get a permit because of safety concerns, et cetera. We tested the water. We had 80 swimmers uh, the last time we ran the swim, swimming a mile and a half in the Milwaukee River, which historically was a place for recreation and swimming lessons and boating. Um, and it's coming back as we do that cleanup work. But we really want not just the river to be clean enough to be able to swim in, but also to talk about who has access to that river. Um, the third ward where we, where we um, swam from is a pretty white space. Um, it's a pretty intimidating or inaccessible space for a lot of communities of color here in Milwaukee. So let's talk about access to, we have a public trust doctrine that says that the, the, the lake belongs to all of us. The rivers belong to all of us. In actuality, though, is that the experience of communities in Milwaukee? And how do we open up those spaces to say, these are your water spaces and they're my water spaces. We all deserve to be at them. And then We Are Water um, is, and I'm hoping that we're going to have some various form of this this year, so keep an eye out, um, but is our celebration event where we really try to highlight cultural water stories and experiences. So. Um, the reason I put these up there is because I think we need to think creatively about how to engage people in the work of building resilient community, of talking about climate and water and environmental issues. Um, and some of the ways you do that is at fun events with music and art and you know, live gatherings when it's safe to do so after our COVID restrictions um, as we tackle this pandemic. Um, I think that is my brief overview. Um, Brenda and I always like to use this slide for our questions because those are our pets. And um, we always liked to bring our pets to work. Now we just work from home with our pets all the time. But So I'm happy to take any questions um, and I'm also available um, if there's anything that you have any follow-up questions about or want to engage in our work. I encourage you to, um, Friend us on Facebook and find us on Instagram and all the socials, um, but also sign up for our newsletter if you don't already get it. We send out usually about once every three, four weeks, send out a newsletter highlighting work that's happening around Milwaukee and ways you can engage. So I will stop sharing my screen and be available if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, yeah, I, I don't see any questions so far, but I encourage folks to, oh wait, we just saw one. When is the We Are Water event and how can people participate? We don't know yet. So um, we're still determining uh, how, how We Are Water would happen. On a normal year, We Are Water can have up to 300 people piled on the beach together. That's clearly not gonna be safe this year. Um, so we don't have a date or a reimagined version yet, but we'll have it, we'll keep it up on our website as soon as we do. Thank you. Um, Kirsten, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the challenges you see in Milwaukee, the most pressing or just efforts that Milwaukee Water Commons will be um, focusing on in the next safe three to five years. Um, is there something in particular? I know there's the governor's task force. I know there's a city county um, plan happening around, around climate action. So just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on kind of critical things going on right now in our city. Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of critical concerns. Um, I mean, the one of the things that's happening right now is there's some pretty big federal conversations happening around infrastructure that could dramatically impact Milwaukee. So um, we have very aging infrastructure, whether it's our drinking water, lead laterals going to, you know, somewhere between 60 and 70,000 lead ho uh, homes still in Milwaukee. Um, we need to address that. That is a community priority that comes up all the time. Um, we also have um, old infrastructure in our sewer infrastructure. And so we just have some pretty, those need to be handled if we're going to be resilient um, in the years to come. And then I think the, the climate policy um, that's coming out of the city county task force is really exciting. They're really looking at equity and jobs 
and you know the connection of climate resiliency to transportation and to to lived experiences of Milwaukeeans. And I think, you know, we know that um, as a as a global community, we're we're up against a timeline. Um, and I think as a state, we are. And as a city, we, we just, we need to move. We're, we're not moving fast enough. We're not, and we're not bold enough and equitable enough. <laughs> um, and so how can we uh, implement the recommendations that are really coming down and, and doing that with, with really good community input as well as really good community education and letting people know what's going on and, and why it matters and, and hearing solutions from them. I mean, I, I guess that's what I just said in the presentation. I'm kind of repeating myself, but but I do think it's critical. I think if we, and I, I think there's a risk that because of the urgency, we'll default to um, you know, the traditional players, which you know might be might have good solutions, but we'll also have flawed decisions if we don't have all of the voices of our city and all the diverse perspectives speaking into solutions, we'll have flawed solutions. And with a crisis like climate change, with the crisis of you know, potential um, water challenges, like we need good solutions that are as best we can, not flawed. So I think that community engagement and making sure that that's a, a multiracial, truly representative um, process is gonna be critical. Um, trying to think of what else, I mean, uh, flooding uh, across our across our state, flooding is going to be um, one of the biggest issues. What climate change looks like in the Midwest is going to be changes in rain patterns. And so, in the city, um, where we experience flooding because of too much concrete um, and because of old infrastructure that's not at capacity. So those issues need to be addressed. In rural communities, flooding means washing away farm fields, ruining crops, ending up with soil in our waterways. And that isn't disconnected from us. I mean, that's where our food is grown. And it also that what happens to the water in a rural community ends up impacting the city. And so I think another critical um, item that we need to address is this bigger picture, this holistic approach to you know, urban and rural and um, not being pitted against each other. You know, we are in a state where rural and urban are often you know, politicized and then pitted against each other. And, water injustice is, it's in both communities. And so I think finding ways to, um, to really highlight the environmental justice issues that are gonna take rural and urban voices is gonna be really important. Thank you. Yeah, so we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, someone asked, can you talk more about how redlining impacts Milwaukee neighborhoods and what neighborhoods are particularly impacted? Yeah, um, I mean, redlining, uh, redlining in general, I mean, I'm guessing the question is because people already know what redlining is, but I mean, redlining determined who could live where for a very long time. And the effects of that um, is that we have very old housing stock um, that is uh, the residence of many of our uh, most vulnerable communities, which in Milwaukee looks like, um, poorer communities, communities of color, indigenous folks, um, non-English speakers. So what comes along with that is with that um, housing stock also is usually um, older drinking water infrastructure um, is uh, prone, areas prone to flooding or basement backups. And the, the, the big challenge is that if you um, don't have a lot of expendable income, you might be able to recover from getting flooded once, but you really aren't going to recover from getting flooded twice or three times. So if you're in an area where you're having regular basement backups, um, that, that is going to, um, can really be debilitating to your family's finances. So um, redlining also built, I mean, redlining created the hyper-segregated city that we live in. And that hyper-segregation isn't just geographical. So we also know that that hyper-segregation is in our schools, it's in our workplaces. Um, it means that we're just really bad at talking to each other. Like we have, it, it, it exemplifies our racism. And we, so I think, 
we, we just have a lot of work to do to dismantle those overtly racist and divided systems um, and open up access and in the climate movement. Thank you. Um, we had an earlier question on um, blue and green jobs. It's exciting to see efforts to advance blue and green jobs. Can you talk a bit more about what you are doing? And then I just wanted to add a note. I did put a link in the chat to an upcoming um, Milwaukee Water Job Fair that's happening virtually on May 12th. Um, so I just dropped that in. Yeah. So what we what we did um, a few years back, we were talking about blue and green, blue green jobs because um, the folks who came to our events and where we, when we talk about um, having listened to 1300 community members, one of the priorities the, of if we're a water centric city, then we should benefit, which means we should we should be have access to the jobs. If we're going to be water centric, isn't there going to be a bunch of jobs? And so we asked the question, how many jobs are there going to be? What are those jobs? Who has access to them? Where are they? How, what do they pay? And not surprisingly, what we found is that many of those jobs, those water jobs, blue green jobs, as we call them, um, are predominantly held by white men. And so we did a needs assessment, really, we did interviews, we looked at the data, we looked, you know, to really underpin um, to have the data to underpin what we believed to be true, which was that these were not, we do not have equal representation from our communities in these jobs. So once we did that research and felt like we could underpin that with data, we met with, um, there's a team of about 12 different organizations that have been working together, including both of our utilities, uh, workforce development organizations, nonprofit organizations, um, we also talked with labor um, to really say, okay, so how do, why are there barriers to these jobs? What are the barriers to these jobs and how can we start to dismantle them? Um, so that can, it means addressing things like um, uh, wraparound services for entry level jobs. It means addressing things like hiring biases and workforce bias. Um, it means looking at the way that jobs are promoted um, we know there's been historically, there's a lot of nepotism where, um, you know, uncles teach their sons and their nephews how to pass the test. <laughs> there were literally gatherings where, um, you know, this is years back, but where they teach each other how to, you know, have the skills and to have the knowledge to be able to pass the test, to get the exam, to, to get the job. And those spaces were not open to everyone in the community. So that um, how can we break open those um, training circles, et cetera, and then um, also work with the employers to um, change their perspectives and any barriers that they unintentionally have, such as um, the MMSD uh, removed, they banned the box, which is the box that you have to tick if you've been formerly incarcerated. They removed it off of their um, job applications. Uh, because of the work done by the task force. So it's a multifaceted approach. We know it's going to involve education, um, but we also just need to get honest and talk about structural racism and bias and hiring in Milwaukee. Thank you, Kirsten. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the importance of having an intergenerational component to this. So when we're talking about um, community engagement and representation, having the voices of our young people present, you know, is so important. Um, can you share a little bit about what your team does um, that would be considered intergenerational? Yeah, that's a great question. We should talk more directly about that. Um, I'm just saying from my, <laughs> I should have that in the presentation. Um, I think it's critical that we have um, that we have diversity across many identities, including age. Um, I think one way we do that is really um, trusting and elevating the voices of young people. Um, I think that we see that um, in the environmental sector, in social justice in general, that um, the younger generation is coming up with less of the silos and the divisions that previous generations had. Um, the idea that 
environmental justice is collected, connected to social justice, is connected to living wage jobs, and is connected to you know, equal rights. That is very much part of the conversation in younger generations in a way that it wasn't before. So I think um, on the other end of the generational spectrum, our elders are critical here, especially our elders that have lived in communities for 30, 40, 50, 60 years and know the history of, you know, this is when the highway came through and it decimated our neighborhood. And this is what it did to the water. And this is what it did to the environment. Um, we need to capture and, and, and be cognizant of that there is history to this work and that we're not functioning in a vacuum. Um, and I think that uh, history, there's, there's work that's happening now that was started you know, in the, the beginning of the environmental movement in the 70s by folks that are still working in the movement <laughs> who were working in it then. So I think connecting that and you know seeing that this is a this is a long trajectory and that we need we need the um, the some of the wisdom of our elders and the new insight of our young people and we can't tokenize that it's not just a place for like let's have a young person read a poem or let's have an elder do a blessing like let's really all be thinking together in order to come up with these strategies. Um, one of the organizations we work with, a couple of them I'll shout out. I mean, we work with uh, True School, which does amazing after school hip hop work. Um, they've been part of Milwaukee Water Commons since near our inception and go through our water school. I mean, they're creating art and speaking into policy um, and have actually been on our leadership team um, as young people. So I think making all those pathways accessible. It's so good to hear. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't see any more questions from our audience members. So I just want to thank you again, Kirsten, for um, stepping in in Brenda's place. We really appreciate it. I know I've learned so much. I'm hoping everyone who attended has as well. Um, please make sure you visit um, Milwaukee Water Commons website, sign up for that newsletter. I get it. I find it so informative. Um, and then also, uh, please visit Milwaukee Public Libraries climate change website if you want to um, see what else we have going on around this topic. Um, and we really appreciate you completing that short survey. So with that, I, I think we're going to close out for the for the evening. So thank you again, Kirsten, and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us.